So I'm all mic'd up. I've got one in each pocket, so we're, we're good to go here. Uh, so thanks, Jason. Um, so this uh, talk is, is trying to, I'm going to focus on probably just more local, regional resources. Um, some of the stuff I'll show you will have national scope to it, but um, they still have things I think that are useful uh, here in the mid-Atlantic region. Um, and that's kind of where I focus it, looking at the four states that were kind of coordinating this, uh, this, this school this, this week. Um, and then just a, you know, just a point of something to mention here. This, this little graphic up here is, uh, shows the, the, the extent of drought in the Northeast region since 2000. So on the far left is 2000, on the far right is 2018, 19 <clears throat> coming up. So you can see the really, you know, big drought of record around here is 2002. Um, and then we had a, in the, in the Northeast region, uh, you have another one over here uh, last summer that was primarily over up in New England. Um, not, not as bad here, certainly, uh, than other places, maybe more up in New Jersey. There was some, some, de some decent drought up there in Pennsylvania, but not right down here in Delmarva. Um, this is why it's important to kind of think about well, what areas are covered when you're looking at data. You know, there's a graph here that says the Northeast region had a drought last year. Well, if you were in Delaware, it wasn't that bad. So just things to keep in mind. Uh, a little bit about the talk that I'm giving. Um, I'm going to focus on, start out with station data resources. Um, so places where, you know, you know I'll call point-based data, stations, uh, yeah, basically that. Uh, Ag-focused and crop-specific data products. These are more your applied, your applications, um, that kind of thing. But, you know, they may be uh, probabilities to disease risk. And then drought information, uh, a few drought tools that I look at pretty regularly for, for various drought information and drought status. And then finally, a little bit on seasonal outlooks and some various uh, uh, predictive tools that I looked at for, for um, seasonal predictions. Um, station weather data, I think the, the one thing to kind of say about that is that there's, there's, there's basically a few options of what you can do to go out and get station data. I'm sure many of you probably go online you know, you want to find the nearest weather station to where you are and what the data are there. Um, some of you may even have your own weather stations, um, your own personal station, or you contract through a company um, for that service. Uh, some people will have a service that estimates what the weather conditions are like, and then some people even have the combined option, right? You, know, you have your weather station on your farm, and then you maybe have somebody comes through and flies drones and looks at the stress on your fields or something like that. Um, maybe they walk through your field to the meter um, and they provide you with some sort of uh, app, you know, output from that. So there's different ways you can go out and get that sort of station level weather. Um, in Delaware, which I'll go in a minute, we have a, a resource there um, that I don't, you know, from what I can, I know and what I've seen, um, it doesn't exist anywhere else in the mid-Atlantic but Delaware. Uh, it's called DEOS and so you can sometimes get reliable weather station data uh, from locations within a few miles of, your, of where you live. Um, more generally, there are a few different resources that are out there. The federal resources, and I guess what I'll say here is I'm focusing mostly on what I'll call free sources of weather, da weather station data. Um, these are not, there's certainly some private options out there as well. Uh, there's the Cooperative Observer Network through the National Weather Service. Um, this is the sort of the grandfather of them all as far as the weather station networks. Uh, they use these uh, old cotton shelters, uh, steaming shelters. They're louvered to let airflow come in. They're white to reflect all the solar radiation and you know, get a more true air temperature measurement inside the box. A lot of times they have a little you know, eight inch wide funnel, rain gauge, metal rain gauge about this high, uh, not far from it. And this has been the sort of the, the classic way we've been taking weather station measurements for years, uh, going back to the late 1800s. Um, even prior to that, some of the forts that were uh, popping up as, as the United States was expanding out west, um, there's been these kinds of station data collected. Our best weather records go back to basically the late 1800s around this region. Uh, there's some places farther up in New England, north, northeast, that have some data going back to 1870s even. Uh, that are that are reliable and, and decent quality data. So that's the Cooperative Observer Network. Uh, 
Then around the 18, 1990s, National Weather Service and the Federal Aviation Administration decided to put together automated stations. Uh, you know, electronics are becoming cheaper, you can miniaturize things. And so they have automated stations, primarily at airports. Uh, some uh, military bases have them as well. And that's the ASOS network, which stands for Automated Surface Observing System Stations. So that's another federal uh, National Weather Service uh, network. And, and this is, by the well, way, I'll just mention, this is not purely exhaustive here. There are other uh, smaller networks out there as well. Uh, USDA has the SCAN network. Um, there are about 270 or so of those stations across the country. Uh, not very many in our neck of the woods. Um, I'll mention that in a minute. Uh, we also have the U.S. Forestry Service, which has the RAWS network, which I won't talk much about, but that's for, mainly for fire uh, danger, estimating the, the risk of fire, uh, wildfires. Um, few around this area, but not, not, not like they have them out west. Uh, and then uh, local regional networks, like I mentioned, DOS in Delaware. Um, there's one I, I, I realized this morning that I had omitted in this presentation. It's called iFlows. Um, it's based in primarily the, the higher terrain locations of Virginia, West Virginia, Maryland. Um, it's primarily there to provide precip data for, for flood prediction. So they're kind of like early warning system type stations. Uh, they have 15 minute precip data, but the data are really segmented. That it's not one continuous network and it's all locally supported by the states. Um, so there's some federal coordination in terms of the equipment but it's the states are the ones that support it and provide the data to the public and it's done in a myriad of ways um, so one challenge with using iFlows and then one other system I'll, I want to mention is the, the Kokoraz network um, which started uh, in Colorado, Fort Collins, Colorado um, after a major flood event there and it's expanded uh, to all 50 states and even internationally so I'll talk a little about that too um, so, the NOAA National Weather Service data, certainly you can go to your local National Weather Service office website and you can go and find the data from local stations. If you're looking for data to go way back in time, um, what I prefer to use is the National Climatic Data Center, um, which I think I have here at the end. Yeah, I'm going to bounce, just a heads up, I'm going to be bouncing around between websites and the presentation so you'll kind of see me like looking all over the place. But um, basically, you go to their website, you can go in there and look up you know, data by um, you know, daily summary. Um, let's see, daily summaries, uh, summary of the month, summary of the year. Uh, they have normals data that you can look at in this system as well. If you really want to get radar data, most people don't. Most people just want to look at the picture. Uh, you can go in here as well. Uh, so there's a lot of data available through this one tool uh, called Climate Data Online, CDO is what they call it. Um, so you can, nice thing about daily summaries, you can go back and pick the daily summaries going back. Um, depending on the station, uh, you can search for you know, data for stations that you know, only existed back in the 40s. Uh, let's say you needed 30 years of data to kind of come up with some average condition of temperature, for instance. You can sort of subset that out in here and search for it and then see what stations are available. Um, and the search capability is really simple. I mean, you can just put in, I don't know, if I could type, Georgetown, Delaware. And then the map will pop up and show you, it's probably going to show me locations that anything that has Georgetown in it. So going to give me locations in other states. Uh, slow load. Everybody's using the Wi-Fi right now, right? It's all right. Um, so you can see all the different locations. This is uh, it also lists them over here on the left-hand side. Uh, Sussex County Airport right here since 1945. Um, we also had the... the um, down at the Carville Research Center, we had a, 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 a long-time weather station there that actually went back. Um, it's not showing up in here. But it, it goes way back uh, to like the 1940s and 30s. Uh, um, so, and other stations around the area. So you can kind of pick your station from here um, and decide what you want to do. I think it's taking so long because it's looking at Georgetown in every part of the country. And even I think I should mention that this system is not just U.S. 
based. It's for internationals as well. The National Center for Environmental Information is a, a World Meteorological Organization data repository. So it has data from all over the world, just petabytes and petabytes of data. It's, it's a, a huge system. Um, they actually have little robots that go around and pull hard drives and move them around whenever you're asking for data. It's pretty cool to watch. Uh, the scan network that I mentioned before, um, and I, I should back up, that, that system, that's the system, that's the ASOS and the Cooperative Server Network, they are all system. The scan network is a USDA system. Um, there's actually, USDA has several networks. Uh, Snowtail is another one. Um, and a lot of what they're focused on is, 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 is on water resource availability, um, mainly out west. Uh, the SCAN network is primarily, a, I'd say, west of the Mississippi uh, system, uh, with some in the upper Midwest. Um, and then in our area, we only have a few stations that are SCAN uh, network stations. We have four in Virginia, uh, one in Maryland, and right now there's no SCAN stations in Delaware or West Virginia that I, that I saw. Uh, the main selling points of the SCAN network is that they have soil moisture and soil temperature data at multiple depths. Uh, a lot of the weather stations that are out there, they're just measuring everything above the ground. But this system, they're, they're providing that, that soil moisture uh, and soil temperature data as well, which, you know, from a USDA standpoint, that's useful because they can take the data, pair it up with satellite information or any other data they got, and come up with, you know, large uh, national or regional products with it. And that's what they, a lot of times they use it for. But you can also access the data as well um, through their, their online website. I think I got that in here. What it did? Maybe not. All right. Well. Um, anyway, it's it's a pretty easy to use uh, website, which I can show you later if you're interested. Um, again, local networks. The only local, well, what we call it a mesonet, stands for mesoscale network, which basically means you know small scale, regional scale type uh, weather station network. Uh, the only one of those that exists in our region is Del is Dios. Um, there's another one nearby in New Jersey. Uh, North Carolina has one as well. Uh, Pennsylvania is working on putting one in. So they're growing. There's about 35 states, depending on how you classify a mesonet, around the country that have their own sort of statewide networks. Uh, most of them are run out of land-grant universities, as you might imagine. Ours has uh, been around since 2004. It's actually where I got my start as a grad student. I went to Delaware for grad school and then needed something to do over the summer. And they said, well, we're going to be putting some weather stations in. You want to go dig holes? Sure, I can dig a hole. Pour concrete, whatever. And so that's kind of where I got started with this. And uh, then eventually the network kept growing. We started out trying to do it for public safety, emergency management. And then other groups were interested in it, whether it be ag or uh, transportation or uh, natural resource managers, whatever, you name it. We've worked with a lot of different folks over the years uh, to put in these weather stations and to build these products and tools using the data that we, we collect. Um, and so now I'm still with it and I'm not sure if I'm ever going to get away. <laughs> we'll see. Um, some stations in neighboring counties besides Delaware, we're mainly focused on Delaware, but we also have stations in other counties, which I'll show in a minute. Uh, it's operated in real time as well as historical. Um, so it's, you know, we're trying to maintain it so that they are useful for, for, you know, future applications that need, you know, 10, 15, 20, whatever many years of data. Uh, and I already said the part about other networks nearby. So this is what our typical DO station looks like. Um, they're only about 10 feet tall, so they're not very high. Uh, other states have 30 foot tall towers. Uh, we did, when we were first starting out, we didn't find any people who wanted to have a 30-foot tall tower on their property. Um, most of them are located on state-owned property or county-owned property. We have a few private landowners that let us, uh, you know, put our stations there um, when, it, when it's, you know, the right combination of things. Uh, this station you see here is actually it's on a farm. It's got, you know, the, the towers here on the left. This thing to the right here is our rain gauge. So the stations measure the whole kind of suite of meteorological measurements. We have air temperature, relative humidity, uh, wind speed and direction. Uh, it's got a propeller anemometer on top to do that. Uh, pressure, solar radiation. Um, most of our stations measure soil moisture and soil temperature. 
uh, at least you know, over half. Um, and then we also have a pretty extensive snow depth network, which is a whole different uh, discussion for another time. But we collect a lot of that, too, for transportation use. Uh, and all this data is collected every five minutes. So it's, you know, every five minutes, all these sensors, the readings, well, it's taking multiple readings per five minutes, but it's all aggregated into five-minute values. And it uses uh, solar power for its power, um, so it's, it's self-contained. It also uses cellular communications, so it doesn't need a telephone or, or anything like that to communicate. So basically, wherever it plops down, as long as it has a, the sun and a cell tower nearby, it can run. It's a pretty uh, basic system. This is what our network's distribution looks like, the map on your left. You can see we've got stations up in Chester County. The reason we went up in Chester County is because a lot of the flooding creeks and streams and rivers in northern Newcastle County, Delaware, uh, the water, actually where the rain happens, is it happens in Chester County and all that water comes down. So we put some stations up there to monitor the weather and the rain gauges uh, of the precipitation up in, in Chester County. There's a couple of sites up in Cecil County, Maryland. That's mainly through some research work some professors at the University of Delaware are doing. Uh, so in total, we have 57 stations, 44 in Delaware. Um, by far, I always have to put the, the, the state map. We're the densest statewide network in the country. But when you're Delaware, that's not hard to do because we're tiny. Uh, we could probably have half the size of the network. We probably have 22 stations and still be the densest network, statewide network in the country. Um, and of course, the, the nice thing about our network is it's, it's all professionally maintained. We have uh, two staff members who at least part of their time they spend going out and maintaining the stations, making sure everything's running right. Um, you know, everything from cleaning out a rain gauge to weed trimming to cleaning sensors, replacing an electronic part, you know, digging holes. Whatever you name it, uh, they, they do all that. Um, that's where I started. And then sensors are calibrated regularly. Uh, we have a preventative maintenance schedule, so we're constantly sending sensors off. Um, we try and minimize time, so when they do fail, we uh, have that happen. Uh, standards, we use the Asabi uh, standards for station um, heights and configurations, uh, siding, and then we also have um, our data subjected to some automated quality control. Um, <clears throat> we try to you know, minimize the amount of bad data to get out and, and use in the various products and tools that we have that leverage this data. Um, and then since 2015, we've had somebody on staff that regularly looks for suspicious data and quality controls that um, you know, to, to gauge how good or bad it is. So it's, it's been a growing and evolving network over time. So on our website, Question. yeah. How many people is it taking to run all that? To run the network, you're probably only talking about maybe two or three people, because you got people going out and doing it, but you also got the computers and all that kind of stuff that run the website and you know provide the data and that side of things. But we've got more than that on staff because we do a lot of other research applications and stuff. We have seven total in our center. Oop, wrong way. Um, so if you've ever, I don't know if you've ever been to our website, but it, this is what it looks like when you come to it. Shows you a temperature maps. You can also pick other maps here if you're interested. Since it's been raining, you can look at how much rain we've gotten in different places. Uh, you can certainly click on the individual locations, and you can see what yesterday's data were. Um, it started raining obviously yesterday around six, five, six o'clock in the evening, so we got some rain yesterday. Um, you can also, I mean. A lot of websites have these, but we also we bring in radar data so you can look at the radar and see where where there's rain. Oh, I guess we aren't completely done with the rain. Oh, maybe it's falling apart. Okay, I haven't looked at the radar in a while. Um, so, and then of course we have other applications on the site, which I'll, I'll talk about those in a minute. Um, it's actually pretty easy to get to them on our website. Um, if you go up here to the top, there's an applications button. And you can see the, the main applications that we've developed and support right now. Uh, I'll talk about the irrigation management system in a little bit. We also have a llama bean risk tool, um, which I may go into if I have some time. And then, but we'll also do a lot of stuff for emergency management. So we have a coastal flood monitoring system, hazard, weather hazard index. We do snow monitoring work for transportation, Department of Transportation Delaware. Work with DENREC on a, a water quality portal as well. So we're doing a little bit of 
of everything as far as uh, environmental data is concerned. Um, Kokora, as I mentioned earlier, uh, it's all volunteer based. Uh, they're always looking for more. Uh, and so basically it's daily observations of precipitation. Uh, most people just report rainfall, but some people do also report uh, snow and other things like that. Uh, every day, Kokoraz is a nationwide system. Um, gets around 10, 12,000 uh, measurements or reports every day. Delaware, or sorry, in our mid-Atlantic states here, we have Delaware, we've got about 45 regular observers, 125 in Maryland, about 250 in Virginia, and 40 in West Virginia. And that's, you can get, it's, it's the easy way to get precipitation data. Um, if you don't have a rain gauge at every location, you don't want to read a rain gauge every location that you're interested in, maybe there's a Kokoraz observer down the street from them and they can you know, report their data online. So um, this is what it looks like here. I can click on the map. I have no idea what I just picked. No, I'll pick. So you can see what um, the reports were for you know, Delaware. Kent County, you can zoom in to the county level. And they have an interactive map that's even easier to use than this. So it's nice. Um, and you know, they don't, they're, not, they're not selective about I mean, You can have people in the same neighborhood part of Kokoraz. But they, their, their motto is every drop counts. So they'll take anybody who's you know, willing to take the time to take measurements and submit them on the website. And this system has been around for about 10 years. So you can go back and get some historical data from Kokoraz as well. Um, sort of get the national precipitation. Uh, I like to go to this site so called water.weather.gov. Uh, there's a lot of different information on there, everything from like uh, flood predictions and that kind of thing. But their, their precipitation data is also on there. Uh, the one nice thing about it is that it's not just radar and it's not just rain gauges, it's actually combined. They've actually uh, taken the gauge data and calibrated the radar estimates to make them better. And then they project that into this sort of national uh, map on a daily basis. Uh, and this is actually useful because they didn't take that to uh, initialize like their flood models and that kind of thing. Uh, it also goes into other products to talk about you know, maybe um, some of the weather forecasts as well. Um, so that site's pretty easy to get to and use. Uh, this was one I just pulled up in the last talk here, but I can pick a different state. Maryland. And so once it refreshes, maybe it will refresh. I don't know. Oh, yes, it is refreshing very slowly. So you can come back and you, for any particular day since like 2005, you can come and look at the national map of precipitation, or you can zoom into a particular location that you're interested in and see how much rain fell. Um, it's, you know, it's kind of one of those Google map tools. You can change the transparency of the precipitation locations underneath it and, and whatnot. Um, but it's, it's nice. It's a nice way to get a sort of a visual picture of what the relative amount of precip that you got in the location. So if you kind of want to see, like, was it three inches, four inches, it's, it's useful for that. Um, so precipitation is obviously our input <clears throat> to our sort of water balance model. Our output is our evapotranspiration. Um, we get questions every once in a while. Hey, how much ET do I expect in you know in May? And so for that kind of answer, I just go over here to the uh, the Northeast Regional Climate Center. They have a monthly uh, potential evapotranspiration um, table. Um, the links are all in the in the presentation as well. And so you can just pick your nearest city. Um, it doesn't vary that much spatially. But then if you can go in there, you can pick the particular month and you know, the, the amount will show up there as, as appropriate. Um, they don't have daily on there. We occasionally get questions about like, what's the average daily uh, evapotranspiration for you know, July 25th. Um, that's not in this. Um, we've been doing, uh, our system and uh, DOS, we've been uh, estimating evapotranspiration using our weather station network for, since it began. Eventually, I want to get around to actually putting an evapotranspiration climatology together, but I haven't gotten to it yet, but um, hopefully someday I will. But um, you can get the daily evapotranspiration estimates from our, our network, our what we call ag summaries, 
on our website. To get to this is very easy. Um, <clears throat> if I go back to our site, just go up here to data, and you can see ag weather summary on the left. It's also down here. It's kind of redundant. And then, you know, pick your month, pick your location, and it'll pop up with the ag summary data. And you can see what the reference ET value for the days were. You got soil temperatures, soil moisture, volumetric, soil radiation, a whole different amount of things. There's a one growing degree day metric calculated here. We only use the base 50 metric in our system. Um, it's not very flexible, but it's there if you want to use it. And then, of course, it does some aggregation for the month and year to date as well down here at the bottom. We are going to be overhauling this to make it a little more useful to, um, to people because um, that's not the most easiest form to work with. <clears throat> so those are the kind of the local ET resources that, that I've, I've used. So looking at ag-focused data products, um, the one that I talk about all the time, I've given talks on, is our irrigation scheduling system. Uh, we started this with NRCS. I see Tim's in the room. You might remember us. <laughs> <laughs> we worked with Tim and, and, and the NRCS folks back in, uh, I think, 2011. And uh, we worked with, uh, I worked with James Atkins and Corey Whaley at UD Extension. We kind of came up with an irrigation scheduling tool to help folks with irrigation management. Um, of course, you know, a lot of times the irrigation management plans are some sort of way of determining when to irrigate, when to schedule. So this is an online tool we created for Delaware. Um, it's called DEMS, it's called Delaware Irrigation Scheduling System. Um, it provides soil water availability estimates for a lot of different crops. The main ones that people use the system for are corn, some soybean. <coughs> uh, lately, like this past year, we had some tomatoes managed in as well. Just depends on what, you know, if someone comes and asks me, like, hey, can you add, I don't know, some other crop we don't have right now. If, if I can find the crop coefficients for it, we'll put it in the system and you can, you can use the system for that. This system is only for Delaware though. Um, and, and the reason is because it's relying on our DOS weather station data. Um, if you were in Maryland and you're right on the, the state line, you can probably use it. It's probably not that much different because it's basically ET doesn't vary that much over, over distance. Um, though the precip can be a little bit problematic. We're hoping to make this uh, product a little more, uh, less state, on, you know, Delaware only. Uh, there's some other weather data resources through the weather service that we hope to pull in that will allow us to kind of grab, you know, data regionally. And, you know, we could, you know, the system could be leveraged for other states to use as well. Um, this uses a fairly tried and true method for estimating transpiration called the FAO 56 method. It's kind of a checkbook method for, for evapotranspiration or irrigation management. Um, and of course, uh, we this year the past we about 130 fields or systems are managed through it mostly with corn. So it's it's a um, it's a pretty popular product, but it you know there's probably like 16, 1700 irrigation systems in Delaware, so we're really only getting a small part of it. If you're interested in using it, let me know because we can get you an account anytime. Um, here, I'll just show you. I just got the wrong thing. Um, I'll close this out. It's still up. Yeah, I bet you it's not going to work. Well, maybe it will. Um, so when you when you log into the system, this is what you see. This table shows you your crop evapotranspiration, your rainfall, irrigation, and that's that's from the user tells us how much irrigation they put in. And then if it's in season, i.e. it's not mature, you also see the soil water content and the deficit and that kind of thing. Um, and then you can click on a field and it should come up with a chart. There it is. And that sort of tracks your, your growing season uh, crop water conditions. So you know, the top line, the blue line there is your field, the orange line is your permanent willing point, obviously the, the managed level that you want to maintain, that red line in the middle. And so basically that is kind of showing you where your crop water is and you kind of want to stay between that red and that blue. Um, and then of course at the bottom here we got the blue uh, irrigation applications, the black bars are the, um, 
you know, precip events, and there were a lot of them. Um, and this, I'll just mind you, this was a, a, a phony station, a phony field that I put in. That's why it starts in January. I don't think anybody planted corn back in January, at least not around here. So that's how that system works, and it's really easy to actually, I should go back and to, to, to add fields to it. You just kind of have to put in a name, crop type, emergent state, and then if you scroll down here, you can just, you know, select a spot on the map, and, you know, that's it. Click Submit, adds your field, and then the system every day will update with whatever the crop water conditions are for that field. You don't have to input weather data or any of that kind of stuff. Um, USDA plant hardiness zone maps. I think most people have probably seen these. Uh, these are always useful tools when someone starts looking at you know, what will grow where. Uh, this one's, I think the last time these were done, it's been a while. So I think probably uh, they're due for an update here pretty soon the way uh, <coughs> our climate data are, are, are going uh, as far as the, the refresh. I think normals are coming up probably pretty soon too. Um, and then you've got you know, this is one for Virginia, or sorry, for Maryland and, and D.C., just showing the kind of the range of, you know, temperatures from one place to another. You got your coldest temperatures, of course, out in your higher elevations to the west. So these are always nice. They're all based off the average annual minimum temperatures, uh, basically the coldest average minimum temperatures. So, you know, basically what will and won't grow in these different zones. It's always a nice reference. Um, for for freezing, you know, freeze conditions, one of the groups I really like their data is our, our product is the Midwest Regional Climate Center called the VIP, it's Vegetation Impact Program. Um, they created this product. It actually goes um, all across the country, not just in the Midwest. Uh, they have a few different tools here. They have um, the chilling hours. They, they accumulate chilling hours if you're looking at chilling hour information. They also have this freeze map, which shows you when freezes occurred, um, which it's right here. I just had this up earlier. Um, so these different colorations you see here correspond to certain days that you know the, uh, the freeze or whatever the threshold. In this case, 32. But if you were looking at say 28 degrees, um, it'll show you where 28 degrees threshold has been reached uh, for the current current year. You can also look back and see how. Uh, which, you know, how we typically, you know, what the typical first freezes are, first time we hit 28, or first time we hit 32 in this product too, and you can do it um, pretty much anywhere in the United States. So it's, it's a really nice tool for, for looking at frost, and uh, sorry, freeze, uh, first and last freeze information. Um, like I said before, they have chilling hours. They also have a stress degree day product um, based on 86 degrees, you know, based on the number of, um, hours or days, uh, or, you know, uh, temperature values above 86 and whether that's putting stress on crops. So it's a pretty nice little tool they have there too. Uh, soil temperature data, we get asked about this from time to time. In our work, we have about 30 locations that have soil temperature at two inches deep. Um, so it's, you know, good for some planting applications. I know that some folks do watch it to see when we re reach certain temperatures in the soil and, uh, you know, adjust their, their planting times based on that. Um, so that's a pretty easy tool to get to. Um, it's through our network summary. You can get to it through the ag summaries I showed you earlier to kind of look back at how the soil temperatures have been trending for a particular month. But you can also see what the current soil temperatures are out there just by going into our network summary tool on our site. And you can just click on the map and see them. You know, it varies from about 48 in Newark <clears throat> to about 55 in Gumboro. So. There is some variability, uh, certainly from location to location, but generally it's, it tracks your sort of typical north-south temperature uh, gradient that we have in Delaware. And then another one that's really useful is up at Cornell uh, through the Northeast Regional Climate Center. Um, that's not it. Um, this is their two-inch soil temperature map for the whole Northeast region. And it just kind of gives you a general sense of what the soil temperatures look like across the whole area here. And it shows the same sort of you know, pattern that we just saw on our, on our DO site as well. Um, another tool that they have that I really like is their climate smart farming. Um, so we get asked a lot of times for growing degree data. And I'll be honest with you, our DO's website is not very useful for that. It's not very flexible. 
But <clears throat> the folks at Cornell through this Climate Smart Farming app, they came up with one. I can find it. Yeah, well, that's the Apple freeze tool. Um, growing degree days on their Climate Smart Farming website. And so basically you pick the location, uh, you pick your date, uh, and then you can adjust the base. So, you know, obviously different pest applications, different, um, you know, heating units and everything are based on different base levels. So you can pick your base, you know, if you're interested, I don't know, 40 degrees. Um, and it will readjust the, the count and show you on the chart here. The other nice thing about their little tool here is they give you a graphic showing with first and last dates of freezes for Salisbury, Maryland. I think they need to do a little QC because I don't buy this one in July. That'd be pretty extreme, wouldn't it? Um, maybe they're maybe they're predicting here. I don't know. Um, so that's it's interesting, but they, 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 the data is all right there. They pulled from their system, and it's a nice tool. It just kind of lets you kind of be flexible about how you check, pick your uh, growing degree day calculations. Um, this site also has um, tools for apple stage freeze probability. So depending on you know what your stage is and your location, they sort of predict what the stage of your apple crop is, and then. Um, knowing that stage, they sort of show you what the, 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 the critical freeze level is for that. So, you know, whether it's petals or whatever. Um, and, and, you know, what the probability of your freezing temperatures reaching below that point. 50% damage is sort of the threshold they use. So it's a nice tool. They also have a great party in this tool, which I'm not too familiar with. But they have, they, they have some nice tools on that site. Another group is called NUA. It's also based at Cornell. It's the Network for Environment and Weather Applications. This one's a, mostly like based on these sort of um, decision support applications. They, they have a lot of them. Apples, tomatoes, potatoes. There's a ton of them out there. Um, and there is, it's very, sta it's, it's station specific, so it's not spatial. But they leverage sort of the ASOS network I mentioned earlier. So if you're in a state that doesn't have a, a NUA network of stations, um, you can at least get those stations to give you back some of this information on, you know, various blight tools or whatever it may be. Um, the one nice thing about their system is if, if, if an extension office or a growers board or something like that wants to participate, they can incorporate data from basically farmer or maintained stations. Um, they have a particular kind of station that will report data straight into their system. And then you can take, you know, all that data, they'll, they'll put it in there and then they'll provide you with the output. If I go up here to crop pages, potatoes. And you go to potato disease models. And it eventually works. There it goes. I don't think anybody's really doing it down there. But, um, it just kind of gives you some growing degree day type counts and whether or not there's potential for potato blight or whatever the, the particular disease our application is. I better move on before I run out of time. Um, if, you have turf, if you have a turf farm, the Northeast Regional Climate Center has a website specifically dedicated to, to turf uh, applications. Um, they have everything from irrigation information, so it's based off of reference ET. Um, soil temperature that I showed you earlier, growing degree day information, seed head recommendations, um, and of course different diseases as well uh, that are common in, in turf grass. So um, that's a pretty good group. I've heard some good things about their, their turf grass site. And, um, I think it's, if you, if you, if you do turf, there's, it's a good opportunity, a good tool to use. And there are many other crop weather risk tools. I won't go and show them all, but uh, called IPM Pipe, um, and that's basically NC State. They they not only provide uh, showing you the locations where downy mildew has been reported, it's, it, sh it shows it at the county level, not at the, the local. Uh, so it predicts the spread, or provides a, a forecast or a prediction of the spread. Um, so that's a nice tool for that. Uh, we, of course, we work with in, in College of Ag and Extension. Um, Gordon Johnson, who many of you know probably, 
uh, to come up with a lima bean risk tool for, for Delaware. Um, and so that just kind of takes in our U.S. weather station data and based on how based on how moist and hot it is, comes up with an estimate of uh, bounty mildew in your lima bean field. And of course, then you can decide if you need to do a fungicide application or, or whatnot. And then last one is we, uh, we poured our data from DOS into the, the wheat scab model uh, up at Penn State University. So if you use that tool and you're in Delaware, you, you're actually using DOS station data um, for, for the head blight prediction for that. Uh, real quick, drought. Um, U.S. Drought Monitor is a very common drought tool that is used uh, you know, for a lot of different applications. It uses both quantity, some, you know, actual uh, soil moisture data and, and rainfall data, of course, to, to estimate drought, but it also uses stakeholder input to look at impacts. And so all that information goes into Drought Monitor, and then, they, you know, multiple federal agencies kind of share that duty of sort of putting that map together every year, or sorry, every week. And then, of course, um, it's all available both nationally and, and locally, you can sort of see what states uh, at your local level, how much of your state is, is impacted by drought. Uh, this obviously has implications for a lot of different um, you know, issues when it comes to you know, farm and, and uh, disaster and that kind of thing. Oh. Uh, soil moisture is another one uh, as far as sort of the drought related products. I like the crop moisture index because uh, it kind of gives you some indication of what sort of drought is uh, um, affecting sort of crop moisture. If I can find it. There it is. Uh, this is from the Climate Prediction Center. And the funny regions you see up there, those are called climate divisions. It's not a normal region. But you can go in there and you see the different uh, places where you've got excess moisture or, or you know, surplus or where you have deficits in soil moisture. Um, and that's all based off of um, in situ data on the ground, but also um, from satellite information as well. And then the last is uh, the ag and drought. Um, this is a nice little tool. It shows you just sort of the location of um, various commodities. It's, it's very limited commodities. It only does like forage crops, cattle, uh, dairy, uh, some, some swine production. And it shows you the location of those, you know, commodities relative to drought. So it just kind of gives you a sense of how drought might be affecting certain commodity groups. Uh, so the dark green areas are like the areas where it's intensively intensive production, the more sparse productions in the more brown areas. Um, and then the hatched red areas, that shows you where the, the, the high drought, it's usually I think D2 or higher is projected on there. And then finally, seasonal predictions. Um, basically, these are different sites, different places where you get climate prediction information from, Climate Prediction Center, um, the Euro model has another one, Columbia University has a good uh, seasonal outlooks, and it, they do things not just, you know, whether you're going to be wetter than normal or drier than normal or whatnot, they also do things like El Nino predictions and other sort of uh, large-scale weather phenomena to sort of show why we're going to be warm or wet or whatever. Um, and the last two things is if you haven't interacted with your state climate office in your state um, and you need climate or weather information, please contact them because that's what they're there for. Um, you know, we, 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 we serve our citizens. We serve our, our businesses and industries in our state. Um, any weather climate information you need, contact us and let us know. We'll get it to you. These are just a list of the, um, the climate offices in the various states that were part of this um, crop school. So, um, I'll skip this, but I'll just say if you're interested in Kokoraz and want to be a volunteer, see me or, you know, go into the Kokoraz website. They're always looking for more volunteers there. And this is just a map showing where, like I showed you earlier. And that's it. So, thank you. <laughs>